from St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. When they interviewed individual officers, the officers would say things like, oh, no, a wanted is what you do before you have probable cause. And so... And that's backwards. That's backwards. This ruling upholds that system, but it also says it depends, and it says, we think there's a lot of problems here. Where, Where does this shake out? Simply going to put in a wanted um, because it it would be inconvenient to fully go and get a warrant, that's not a a valid justification for wanted. I'm Danny Wisentowski. In St. Louis County, there is a big difference between a warrant and something called a wanted. See, a warrant requires a police officer to show probable cause to take their findings to a judge, who then evaluates whether that evidence supports an arrest. It's the judge who decides. On the other hand, a wanted requires a cop simply enter a target's name, address, and other information into a police database. And crucially, it doesn't involve a judge at all. And yet the practical result is largely the same. You get arrested, held, questioned, sometimes prosecuted, other times released. But wanteds are not the same thing as warrants. And this was a major takeaway from a ruling in federal court earlier this month handed down by the Court of Appeals for the Eighth Circuit. And to talk about that ruling and what it means for a system that's long faced criticism in St. Louis County, we welcome to the studio Maureen Hanlon, the lead attorney for civil rights litigation at Art City Defenders. Maureen, welcome to St. Louis on the Air. Thanks for having me. Maureen, Art City Defenders has been suing St. Louis County over these wanted, uh, this policy for several years. And it's that case, that lawsuit, that was taken up by the federal appeals court earlier this month. So tell us, what is a wanted, and what is the problem with it that you have? A wanted is an unconstitutional way, we allege, for a police officer to send out an order to other officers to arrest and detain an individual for questioning. Now, as you noted, typically, to make such an arrest, police would need to bring the supposed probable cause for that arrest before a judge and get a warrant. Wanteds are an end run around the warrant requirement, and it empowers a police officer to go pick up an individual and bring, haul them in, arrest them for questioning. And we think to do that, police officers either need to have a, have a warrant signed by a judge or fit into the very limited circumstances where someone could make a, a warrantless arrest. Now, why would a police officer want to, to use a – why would they use a wanted perhaps instead of a warrant? Is, is it just quicker? So – What the Eighth Circuit pointed out is that the inconvenience of obtaining a warrant is not a valid justification for issuing a wanted rather than going to get a warrant. And and the justification from St. Louis County in court was in large part based around the convenience to its officers for sending out this order to allow people to be picked up and arrested for questioning. And what the Eighth Circuit said is, you know, inconvenience isn't a good reason to disregard the requirements of the Fourth Amendment. And and the ruling, you know, in in that area, it made the point that other police departments don't use this kind of system and that St. Louis County's use of this and this wanted system, because it involves the police database, it means that it covers both Missouri but other places that use this database. So in Illinois as well, and in some cases, you know, nationwide. Um, But they they said that um, this is rare, you know, just because... It's easier to get a wanted out than to go to a judge. That's not a good reason, and yet it's still there. Why why is it so entrenched in this particular place in St. Louis County and seemingly very few other places? So we filed this case in 2016, and the data uh, that we collected through litigating shows that over 15,000 of these wanteds were issued between 2011 and 2016. And you're right, it's a rare practice. And in fact, as far back as 2015, the Department of Justice, uh, in doing their report on the practices of Ferguson, pointed out the flaws with the system, pointed out that they had never really seen police departments sort of empower themselves in this way, and pointed out the constitutional perils of this. And you're right, it persists to this day throughout the city, throughout the county, even though key officials have noted, you know, that these are constitutionally fraught. Uh, So to answer your question, it seems to be localized, and it's not 
clear why local governments are so attached to continuing this wanted system, uh, even when a variety of people starting in 2015 with the Department of Justice have said, hey, these these don't really pass constitutional muster. Now, you know, on, on that report in 2015, you know, the U.S. Department of Justice, they had went in at in the wake of the Ferguson protest. They were looking at the, po- the policies and practices of that police department. Part of it was these revelations of the way that a lot of the policing there seemed to be targeting at um, you know, people of color, motorists who would then be bounced from municipal jail to municipal jail, extracting as many fines as possible. That report said policing can't just be about making money, but it also can't just be about, you know, detaining people when it's convenient. And there were some pretty specific um, conditions in that consent decree, but only directed at the Ferguson Police Department. Did that decision affect anyone else? And, you know, why did no one else take this as a signal when only Ferguson seemed uh, to have been in the target for for fixing this longstanding practice? What's confusing, to be honest with you, is that key decision makers in St. Louis County um, have long recognized wanted as being constitutionally problematic. So, you know, when he was first running for uh, election, Wesley Bell, I think, just called wanted, you know, said these are unconstitutional. But because Ferguson was the only one under this consent decree, they, they're, they've they been the only ones that have been sort of forced, uh, were sort of prompted or forced to forego this practice. And, it, and you know, We are excited to continue litigating this. We think that this decision gives us a lot of legal avenues to continue to to force the issue that these are these are not constitutionally compliant. But there is there is certainly nothing stopping governments from just stopping this practice right now. So given given the long criticism of this case and given the Eighth Circuit's rulings, you know, truly nothing is stopping St. Louis County from saying, hey, we're going to require our officers to get a warrant like they do everywhere else in order to arrest someone. Now, one of the one of the really interesting um, pieces of analysis about what this wanted is and what it allows officers to do that, that perhaps warrants don't or, or do in a different way um, is something that actually happened uh, to one of the clients on your case. This was a, a situation where a wanted was issued for him. He was accused of a crime. Um, a one police officer fills out this wanted, punches in the information to the database, hits enter, And in the meantime, things change in this investigation. It turns out the allegations fell apart. But that wanted still existed in that database. And it led a different police officer to arrest this man. And that police officer didn't check that things had changed. And and that has resulted in your lawsuit. And this ruling, this, this ruling that just came out of the appeals court, said that that second cop, made a real error, an error that they can be sued for by not checking in this investigation. And that, that was a big deal. Um, tell, tell us about that and what that, that that ruling says about how this system is used. So what the Eighth Circuit found is that one of the individual officers uh, who, who did uh, put out this wanted to allow for this warrantless arrest, uh, you know, as we've said, did not get a warrant, did not uh, check to see whether things in the case had been updated, did not adequately investigate, that this officer is not entitled to something called qualified immunity, which uh, allows officers to be shielded from suit. And so that this officer actually can be held personally liable for uh, setting up a warrantless arrest without without real probable cause. And and what this says to us, why this is important, is that it means that officers right now who are going into the same system thinking, well, I don't, I don't want to go get a warrant. I'll just, I'll just put out a want, wanted for this person. Uh, they can be held liable if they also are putting out these wanted without sufficient probable cause. And you know that is one of the reasons for the warrant requirement is to have a person sort of to, to have a judicial officer sort of check to see, is there actually a reason to pick this person up and detain them? So, you know, what this opinion, one of the most important parts of this opinion is that it it showed that individual officers can be held liable. And we're, we're obviously going to continue pursuing for our client who, frankly, had no opportunity to challenge this order for his arrest, no procedural way to intervene in this in this order that picked him up, held him, caused him to spend a day in jail uh, for a crime that he's never been charged with and that, that, frankly, there was very little reason to suspect he committed. 
We're talking with Maureen Hanlon. She's the lead attorney for civil rights litigation at the Arch City Defenders. We're talking about a recent federal appeals court ruling looking at St. Louis County's system of wanteds. Um, Maureen, one of the things that really stood out to me about this ruling is that the judges are clear that there are, is a constitutionally okay way for this wanted system to exist. And, and there's a lot of, of reasoning behind that and tradition and the way police have used this in the past, a, like a wanted poster. Um, there is a tradition for this. But the ruling goes to great lengths to explain the many, many ways that this system can be used unconstitutionally. And that second part, the unconstitutional way, that really seems to be the way St. Louis County is using this system. This ruling upholds that system, but it also says it depends, and it says, we think there's a lot of problems here. Where where does this shake out? Is is this ruling saying multiple things to us? So we don't read the opinion to uphold the system. So what the opinion states is that there are rare instances in which a wanted can be constitutional. And those rare instances really overlap with, you know, long established exceptions to the warrant requirement, uh, you know, such as when there's some sort of emergency or a police officer were to, to, to literally witness someone committing a crime. But what they, the opinion makes clear is that wanted, the way 97% of wanteds are issued, 97 being my, my terminology here, that, you know, simply going to put in a wanted um, because it it would be inconvenient to fully go and get a warrant, that's not a a valid justification for wanted. And so even if wanted, even if every single wanted is not unconstitutional, under the reasoning of the Eighth Circuit, most wanted are because it's just an officer issuing this wanted rather than taking the proper steps to go get a warrant. Mm. Do you see, is the court sending a message to St. Louis County? Your, your wanteds are legal, but most of the ways you're using it are really, are, 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 are really problematic to us, the court. That, am I reading that correctly? So I, I never presume to guess what judges are saying. That's dangerous for a lawyer. Mm-hmm. But I, I think what this opinion holds, and we're delighted that we, we've gotten this legal reasoning agreeing with us, is that you know if you're a municipality reading this opinion, there are real liabilities and there are real problems for you to insist on using these wanteds, uh, that this could create serious legal implications for your department if you insist on using what, what the Eighth Circuit says are constitutionally fraught at best. Um, and, you know, if, if you're a citizen listening to this, you know, that's a good question for your local officials is wh- what, why continue to utilize a practice that simply allows for the easier a- arrest of civilians rather than forcing police officers to follow the same rules that police officers really everywhere else follow? Mm-hmm. Now, in that qu- court ruling, they summarize the defenses provided by St. Louis County. Um, why does this policy exist? And and part of what they say is that these officers are, are sending these wanteds out because when they apply for the warrant, they need all of their witness information already put together. They need to bring a very strong case to the prosecuting attorney, who, Wesley Bell, in this case. Do they need wanteds to do that? Do you, do you take that, that rationale seriously? I don't take that rationale that seriously. So first... Uh, one of our clients in this case, one of our plaintiffs, a wanted was issued against him because he chose not to talk to the police officer. And and as you know, citizens have a Fifth Amendment right to, to not speak to police officers. But there's there's simply nothing preventing from police officers from just going and seeking interviews with people. What what a wanted allows is for that, that citizen who is not charged with a crime to just be picked up, arrested, and, and brought in for it to simply be easier for the police officer to question that person. But you have to trade that off with people are getting yanked out of their cars, people are missing work, people are not being able to pick up their kids from school. I mean, there's all these collateral consequences for civilians when a police officer, you know, there's really nothing preventing them from just seeking to interview this person. And and these wanteds, they stay in the system for a long time and it, in in Correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounded like the judges were saying, we're not really even sure how many of these may have been issued and the way that they're retained in the system because they're this informal arrest. They exist kind of in the gray area. You know, that wanted could be in a system for years. It could, 
you know, a traffic stop years down the line after your case is, is completely done, that could still result in your detaining a- an arrest. Is, is that a worry that, that regular people should have? It's absolutely a worry. I mean, the reason this issue came on our radar is because we had clients who were getting picked up and we had no idea how to help them even challenge these wanteds because they existed outside of normal court process. So, you know, for a warrant, there is a clear method to challenge a warrant. There's a you can quash a warrant, you can take steps to intervene. And with wanteds, not only did people not have notice of these wanteds, they did not have an ability to challenge the wanted, but even when there were lawyers trying to help them figure it out, it was almost impossible to see how to get this wanted cleared, even when, as you pointed out, you know, the circumstances of the underlying issue ha- have long since changed. I was really struck by a- another note in-, in this ruling that said that in September of 2016, while the lawsuit was pending, the St. Louis County Police Department added a new requirement to its wanted system, saying that a supervisor has to approve a wanted before it's entered into the system. Was that a reaction to the lawsuit? And, and should we presume that until this point, no supervisor would okay, just a wanted filed by a rank and file police officer? Um, was, was nobody keeping an eye on this? I think it's safe to assume that if there wasn't supervisor requirements before we filed the lawsuit, uh, that was added in, in reaction to the lawsuit. And I think it's also safe to assume that wasn't something that was happening before. You know, when the DOJ was interviewing officers in Ferguson, one thing they found is that the office, although Ferguson maintained that all of the wanteds issued were supported by probable cause. You know, when they interviewed individual officers, the officers would say things like, oh, no, a wanted is what you do before you have probable cause. And so, mm. you know, and I, that's backwards. That's backwards. And I think it goes to whether or not the policy says, uh, you know, officers theoretically have probable cause, so don't worry about it. Here we can see, you know, the Eighth Circuit found in our case that the individual officer did not have probable cause, so that the individual officer here just issued this arrest order for a client without, you know, probable cause is a lenient standard, right? And and the officer here didn't even have sort of good reason to believe our client had committed a crime before picking him up. And we think, we think people in St. Louis deserve more procedural protections. We think they deserve, you know, only to be arrested if there's a really good reason to do that. Maureen, thank you so much for being here today. Thanks for having me. This episode was produced by Danny Wisentowski. Audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Dorr. Our production intern is Avery Rogers. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. Our podcast proudly supports St. Louis artists by using music from Life Creative Group. Do you find yourself regularly listening to episodes of St. Louis on the Air? Suggest us to a friend you think might enjoy our conversations. And leave us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the simplest way to help people discover our show. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, providing more than 41,000 jobs in the production of wood pallets, railroad ties, white oak barrels, hardwood floors, and more. Details at ChooseWood.com.